So now we've got our last panel. And if you're wondering why we're all here, why Tech Freedom exists, this is the panel for you. And I want to remind you that after this, um, after the closing remarks, rather, there will be an after party at Local 16 at 6 p.m. So we'd love to see you all there. If you like eating and drinking for free as much as I do, I expect to see you there. Um, but without further ado, the man, the myth, the legend, Baron Soka. Uh, thanks, Evan. And uh, Evan is too modest to have mentioned his podcast. Uh, if you're not listening to the Tech Policy Podcast, I encourage you to do so. I think we're approaching 100,000 downloads. Uh, we were about 180 episodes. Uh, I couldn't be prouder of the show. Uh, if you can stand listening to Evan talk, uh, it's great. We have great guests, um, including myself and Mike, and Virginia will be on soon, and uh, many people here in the room. So uh, please do check that out. But without further ado, uh, this, this is the panel that really excited me about the day, and it's a way to pick up in a way where Representative Cox left off this morning, which is the big picture of why we're here. And, uh, and the panel we're going to start with today will... We'll, go back to the future and, and ask uh, what things looked like in the 1990s, the last time that Congress really had to grapple with hard questions about the internet. So I'll, I'll introduce uh, everyone quickly. Uh, Véronique de Rougy, uh, here from the Mercatus Center, uh, is here from uh, one of the uh, perhaps um, most uh, engineering-oriented um, and, and engineering-minded cultures in the world, and has obviously chosen to live in the United States instead. Uh, and, and has uh, worked uh, at Mercatus on uh, tax and other policy issues, which is one of the themes we'll be talking about today, but also brings another cultural perspective to th this panel and this discussion, which is really about how we think about culture. Uh, Mike uh, Mandel, in addition to being my next door neighbor, uh, also I is- get, I get Barron's Wi-Fi. <laughs> <laughs> and I just switched to files, so it's, uh, it's even faster than it was before. <laughs> Uh, Mike is uh, chief economist at the Progressive Policy Institute uh, and, and writes about all the issues that we work on uh, from a, uh, what is it, radically pragmatic? Radically pragmatic. Radically pragmatic perspective, uh, which is to say that we might start from different premises and might have different opinions about some pol uh, political issues and yet wind up in surprisingly similar places on, on topics of tech policy, which is exactly the theme of this panel how to transcend uh, left-right uh, old paradigms. And on that theme, I couldn't have asked for anyone better to, to tell that story than Virginia Pistrel. Uh, her book, The Future and Its Enemies, came out when I was a freshman in college. Uh, I read this. It was one of the, the three books, and of the three, the, the most important, that inspired me to do what I do today, to go into tech policy, to join the Progress and Freedom Foundation with Adam Thier, and then to start Tech Freedom in 2011. Uh, her, the story that she tells here, which we'll talk about a little bit after the, after the panel, is really about how to think about the future, and, and, and most importantly, how not to think about the future. Uh, so that's where I wanted to start today. So again, 1990s, uh, the internet was becoming a thing. Congress had to do something. The courts were wrestling with this, as Representative Cox said today. I just want us to try to get back in that mood. We've, we've had some music on today that's mostly been 80s music. The theme that I really wanted to, to, to um, get to was about 1996, 1996 and 1998. The internet's just about to take off. Virginia, you, that's the world in which you, you started writing this book. How were people thinking about the future then? Okay, well, the, one of the interesting things about the book is that people assumed that it was this dot-com optimist book. But it was actually inspired by living in Southern California in the early 90s when the uh, after the end of the Cold War, there was a tremendous amount of unemployment, particularly among white-colored people in the aerospace industry. And I don't know if any of you remember the movie Falling Down. That was kind of the touchstone. And, and then also there was a growing anti-growth movement. And those two things were actually sort of what inspired me originally to look at the book. But in terms of taking us back to this sort of internet 90s, I have one slide and two stories. Uh, so if we could have the first slide, please. <laughs> um, maybe but, maybe a uh, OK, later. whatever. We'll see it later. OK, I'll just start with the stories. So the first was, so I was editor of Reason Magazine in the 90s. And we had a lot of tech the people in the tech industry, engineers and stuff, who were supporters. And they kept sending me notes and saying, telling my boss, you guys need to get on the internet. First it was, you guys need to get email. And so I got CompuServe account, 70702.2152. You know, AOL letting you use a name was a huge advance. Um, 
but, but then they said, you've got to get on the internet. Well, what should we do? So I met with this guy named Mark S. Miller, who's a brilliant computer scientist and now in security at Google. And I said, Mark, um, what, what should we do to get on the internet? And this is like 1993. And he said to me, there's this thing called the World Wide Web, and it's going to be big. Well, this was before the browser. This was before anything. So it's like, OK. And he, his advice was just wait for that thing and, and then get on it. And the other is an 80s story. Back when I was a baby reporter in about 82, 83, uh, I covered MCI during the Bell breakup for the Wall Street Journal. And when I had my first get acquainted meeting with them and tour of all the company, they explained to me about their tiny, tiny little cell phone division. And they did a really great job of explaining the technology of cell phones and how a pass, signal passed from tower to tower. And I kind of got the general idea. But I was like, but what would you need it for? What would you use it for? Is this like for a car phone? Totally, total failure of imagination. And I think what these two stories illustrate in my mind is the first one is you can realize that something is going to be big and have no idea of the many different ways in which it's going to be big. And the other is the opposite, which is that there can be something that seems really small and specific that turns out to be really big and take you in many different directions. And in the early 90s, I think we were, kind, or in the, the mid-90s, the period you're talking about, we were on that, those were the things we were struggling with. People had the sense that the internet was big, but they didn't know what, what it would mean. There was no way they could know. And there were a lot of people who just saw it as big and scary and wanted to stop it in some way. I was in France at the time, and um, I had my first email address was kind of like yours, yeah. And but at the time it was like, and, and it's still the case. Like I had friends who understood what it was about and said, and I I got that it was it was something I should have, but never really understood. And I still don't understand how email works, and and but it was computer also. It was a computer address, and I will never forget. Like for years until I moved to, to the US and things started to evolve in terms of emails. Like you would stay behind your computer and it would go, you know, it would dial and go, and you would hold your breath. Is it gonna work? That's good. And then you would connect, except that I only had two friends to email for years. But you liked them. For years. I, I liked them, but I was like, yeah, I was thinking, good. oh, you know, and, and it was just like, I, it just kind of like going back to thinking about this. And, and trying to think about whether I could foresee uh, what it would become, how easy it would be, how that it would be free. Like it would, I mean, it just, it's, it's just astonishing. And I think being in France, you didn't even have. You had Minitel and you were. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> which, which made the same noise. <laughs> <laughs> but like my computer still makes that noise. This is, this is where I wanted to start this conversation. Virginia you used the term failure of imagination. And in a way, I take your book to be about, about that theme generally, that people have a hard time imagining what the future will look like, or, or that they think that, that they know. Well, that's the, I, I, oh. no individual, no matter how brilliant and insightful, and I could point to people in the 90s who said things that were truly brilliant and insightful and, and predictive of where we ended up in, in specific ways. But no person can imagine everything. It's just impossible. Yeah. And, and, and so the big message of the book is that the future emerges from decentralized trial and error. And, and that, that not only that the future does emerge that way, but that that's the route to learning and exploration and improvement. Yeah, I, I did. Uh, in the late 2000s, maybe 2007 or 2008, I actually went back and I did a systematic study of what people were forecasting in the mid-90s in terms of technology. Um, and Well, actually, let me just say something. If you go back to 1995 and 96 when Robert Dole was running against Bill Clinton, he was running on the that the economy was stagnant yeah. and that the productivity number, growth numbers were poor which they were at that point, they were later revised up a lot. So it's actually important to remember that sometimes what we think of 
as going on in the economy now changes his, when you look back in history. And that's a really important point when you sort of think about the economic statistics. But I went back and I sort of looked at the forecasts that were being made uh, in, in different technology areas in terms of biosciences and information technology. This is sort of 96, 97, looking forward. Uh, biosciences, material sciences, transportation, and so forth. What was astounding was that every IT-related forecast came out better than expected. Anything that was not IT-related didn't happen. And it was astounding because you, you know, you looked on it. I was looking at a ten-year time frame. Electric cars on a ten-year time frame didn't happen. People expected it to happen the next day. Uh, in terms of um, uh, cheaper drug discovery, it didn't happen. In terms of gene therapy, which people thought that we were right on the verge of at that point, we still don't have a commercially available gene therapy right now. And you go down and you sort of nanotechnology has turned out to develop much more slowly. So one of the things that to add to what you were saying is that people not only get it wrong by undershooting, they get it wrong by overshooting as well. It's very difficult on a 10-year time horizon or even on a one-year time horizon to s figure out what technology is going to do. I went back, I redid the study again, looked back at um, uh, the year 2006. 2006 was an interesting year because it was, on, it was just before Apple introduced the smart, the iPhone, and it was just before fracking took off. And you look in the smart popular press, which is the business publication, the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, uh, you know, Financial Times, and so forth, you saw not zero, but almost no signs that these big changes were about to happen. So I sort of view technological change as fundamentally unpredictable and getting to the policy idea, that policy has to sort of accept that that technological change is going to be fundamentally unpredictable, or we're going to sort of, we're going to make mistakes. Let me, uh, I, I'd love to follow up on two things. First of all, on the bio area. In the, so in the future and its enemies, I tell this story about my friend's little kid, who's very little in the uh, time, who has cystic fibrosis. And it's, it's the story about why you should be for gene therapy and blah, blah, blah. Okay, now this kid is like out of college and he's super healthy. And we don't have gene therapy, but it turns out that there were so many incremental improvements in, in drugs for cystic fibrosis over the period that you know when he was in high school, at one point he saw a different uh, pediatrician and the guy couldn't even tell that he had cystic fibrosis. So you can have this kind of unglamorous, to cite one of my newer works, unglamorous kind of public policy uh, progress that accumulates to important things. I'm not public policy progress, but innovation. Uh, and, and the other thing is in, the, er, in that early 90s, mid 90s period, there were things going on and the, the very important in my life, which is that the, the early tests of uh, the cancer drug Herceptin were taking place. And uh, this is for a specific type of breast cancer, HER2 positive breast cancer, that previously had, you had like a terrible dire uh, uh, prognosis if you had it. And it was approved by the FDA for the treatment of stage four breast cancer in, in 1998. And in 2007, I had breast cancer diagnosis, and my and I was treated with this drug, and I'm cured. Um, and my oncologist says that before that, I would have had a 50, given the specific case in my situation, not the general, not the aggregate statistics, I would have had a 50-50 chance of surviving, much less uh, um, uh, making it to being cured. So you do get kinds of progress that are in the category but below the radar, not what people are paying attention. This research was taking place in UCLA, which was not a major cancer center at the time. So, so everyone says this, right? In DC, everyone says, oh yeah, yeah, we know the future is, uh, is things are moving really fast and we need to be careful about, about getting it wrong. So people, people talk about that. that. That's almost universal in the tech policy world. But I don't think people mean the same thing when they <laughs> say it. Right, so, and, and, and both of you 
um, and, and also, Veronique, in your own way, what, what you've really touched upon is, I think, something a little uh, more profound than what most people really mean, which is, is that, that fundamental lack of a frame of reference, that, that inability to, to, to predict, to have analogies that work. Because I was just talking to the staffers who were on the last panel about this. They, they uh, from their perspective, one of them said, this is, it's all about dueling analogies. And, and if you think that it's one analogy, uh, if, if, if cyber um, threats are like bioweapons, then maybe the Wassenaar approach works. And if they're not like that, maybe it doesn't work. H how does your thinking about the future, A, differ from the way that you think most people um, talk about this, and B, what does it therefore mean for, for policymakers? So I wouldn't argue with anything that Virginia said. So we've spent the, I need to go through biosciences because it's just really important in thinking about this. We've spent a trillion dollars in R&D over the last 10 years in biosciences, public and private. Okay, we've gotten stuff out of it, but in terms of looking at people's life expectancies overall, especially in, in mid-year, you know, we, we're ending up with sort of, you know, falling or stagnant life expectancies for a lot of people. And so the, the interesting question, the interesting question here is do we regard this as a period of fast innovation or slow innovation? And I tend to regard this as a period of fast innovation for in IT and slow innovation in other areas. And I'll just give one example, which is if you look at the speed of airplanes, I think they've actually slowed down, okay, the average speed. And I think and this partly has to do with the fuel savings and it's partly have to do with uh, that we've, uh, we, don't, we went backwards in terms of using the supersonic jet. And you can, think, you can think a lot about this, but if we were actually to sort of say, what's our best measure of, of innovation in air travel, it would be the speed at which you get somewhere. And I can go through a lot of different examples like that. And, and, and I'm sure Virginia and I can have a very nuanced discussion about biosciences and healthcare. And I actually suspect in the end we would, I would agree with all of her examples and it would still sort of come to the same thing. Okay, but it. I just have to say, the other thing about Herceptin is the basic research was funded by Revlon yeah. and, and celebrity uh, fundraisers. It was not funded by any of the major cancer charities or the NIH. <laughs> uh, that's, that's, well, uh, about, uh, most of the, most of Because it was the, a crazy idea. Nobody believed in this guy. Nobody heard of him. And when I say trillion dollars, including both the pri private money as well. So if you view this as having uneven innovation, okay, and that, er that we have areas which have, which have had rapid innovation, other areas we've had slower innovation that has either not been encouraged by government policy or actually slowed down by government policy, then you come to this with a different, with a different, uh, in a different sense. The, the way I would describe it is, there's uh, picking up the terms they use at MIT. There's the world of atoms, and there's the world of bits, and it's easier to innovate in the world of bits, partly because the footprint of the regulatory, all the different forms of regulation is much less, and we see the, these two worlds colliding. Uh, I, I think most prominently right now in the housing markets in tech centers uh, where you, you know, there's nothing more world of atomsy than trying to build anything in California. <laughs> and, um, and, and yet you have all these people who are doing things in the world of bits and, and it's. Well, this, this actually, this is, this is maybe a good way to illustrate the, the general theme that we're talking about. So just take the example of San Francisco because our, our theme here is, is not so much specific policy issues, although we're going to get to those in, in tax and jurisdiction in a minute, but, um, but the way that people think about, about the role of government. So San Francisco is a really interesting example where on the one hand, it is the most creative place on the planet by many, many measures. You've got the tech world centered there. You have people who would say, oh, how dare the government try to, 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 to lock us into a particular way of doing things. And yet this is also the part of America where it is perhaps most difficult to build housing, which in turn means that housing is really expensive and it becomes really difficult to hire people. The labor market, people are increasingly writing about this, is heavily restricted because people can't move there. Just as immigration restrictions to the United States restrict the pool of people who can come and, and innovate. And, and in your book, Virginia, you write a lot about uh, creative verges, about right. places where people come together to create. So, 
how do you how do you explain that that disconnect where people there can on the one hand say you know we need to have more brilliant people coming to the United States to help contribute to our economy and and we need to be able to create and innovate and yet say oh my god I wouldn't want the building next door to me to be more than four stories I mean what does that say about about their willingness to accept change in their own lives or in the place that they live and, and you know, on a larger that scale. It doesn't bother me at all. Okay, I just as soon have some of the uh, tech firms and innovation located in other places around the country. I'd rather, and, and, and you, know, we, you know, everybody's sort of having this debate at this point about the need for more concentration and the need for more density, and, and in the abstract that that's true, but in, from, the, from the political economy sense, we'd be just as, ha we'd be just as well off having our, our growth centers distributed around the country. And so I'm not prepared at this point to sort but of the argue. Let me finish, yeah, let me finish yeah. please. He was going to interrupt you first. <laughs> That's okay, he's the, but he's the moderator. Okay. <laughs> Mike, Mike, I'm actually asking a different question. I'm not asking, was that good or bad? What I'm saying is, again, if our, if our topic here is how people think about the future and about change, yeah. it is remarkable that you have some of the most pro-change people in some areas of their life who are very um, resistant to change in other areas of their life. And, and Virginia, in the future and its enemies, you, know, you talk about this, about how it, the, the, no one person is, is consistent about this. And, and the example that sticks with me best is, is Newt Gingrich, who in many ways well, he's not consistent is, is <laughs> it, it, there are some parts of Newt Gingrich's career that are very dynamist, to use your words. And you use the example of the 1996 Republican Convention when he gets up and, and, and free associates and gives a speech about how vo volleyball is a gr the great American sport. And because it's true that the culture is changing and sports he are changing. Beach volleyball. Beach, beach volleyball, right? And, and he, was, he was lambasted for that as, as unserious, right? So in some ways, he's very able to accept change in, in cultural dimensions. And yet in other areas is very much top down and wants to try to plan and control things. So what I'm trying to get at here with the example of housing or with the example of Gingrich is, is those competing visions. I still don't see it. Because I think what we you, if you go back if you go back and you look at the I'm 19 here. if you go back and you look at the nineteen twenties, okay, which is a great decade to go back and look at, you actually saw tremendous growth in manufacturing at the same time you sort of had issues in rural areas. And so we've always had these two issues going on at the same time, economics pushing forwards uh, and innovation pushing forward at the same time. People are trying to hold on to their culture and- But it wasn't the same people. This, it, is, why, it, this is why I give the example of San Francisco. I'm not sure it's the same people in San Francisco either. Okay, it's not the same people. It's different people and in the people, the San Francisco is not simply made of the, of the tech community. Um, and so, I just, I just think in the end that we're always going to be dealing with these two problems at the same time, the need for uh, innovation and growth to lift living standards, and also the need to sort of take care of the people that are being left behind. And um, I think that we have to balance, we have to balance both of these in, uh, in, our, in our policies. And uh, so I'm, I'm, just not, I'm just not seeing it, I'm sorry. In San Francisco, it is probably, it is not the same people. In Palo Alto <laughs> and the west side of Los Angeles, okay. it is the same people. Which are even so, more restrictive So, well, you know, so it depends. In San Francisco, it's, it, it, it's proper. It really is, a, it's a, it's, there are different things going on. Um, but there is a problem with, and there's been some studies, and I, I, I feel bad, I can't remember the economists who did them, but it was a co-authored paper, but we have a, a problem where people, if, if you're, say, a bartender, your productivity and your income will be higher if you can move from, let's pick a place that's not totally depressed, Philadelphia <laughs> to, yeah. or, 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 or um, you know, or, or uh, Cincinnati to, San Francisco or Los Angeles or Austin or something like that. But your ability to do that, housing becomes an issue. Um, so there is uh, an issue of upward mobility and inequality embedded in this, this housing thing too. But I don't want to get too far out there. 
in California, I can only, I'm from LA, I, I can't, I don't want to speak about everyone in the world, but in California, you definitely have a culture where um, the, the idea that the environment should not change and the creative economy, whether it's Hollywood creative, games creative, tech creative, whatever, are intermixed. 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 They're, they're, and, and, so the world around, the, the physical environment around me should not change, but everyone should be creative and also we should be, have a lot of social change. Well, so, so this, this I, I let us down a rabbit hole with the housing example, uh, which we, we talked about on our, on our, on our call. This is kind of an obsession but, of mine. But, but this is actually, and, and I, want to, I, I want to get to the... Um, I, I'm the privileged one. I have a place I bought in 1992. <laughs> smart move. Uh, until the, the next, the big one comes. But... Um, you can talk about that too if you want. It's the land that's valuable. <laughs> that's true. Although, so this is my question. And, and I, I, want to, I want to get to the, to the internet and, and to, to jurisdictions and governance role, but just... Just to, to tie this all together, what, what you're really describing, again, is about um, people's willingness to accept change in the world. And one of the themes that we are doing more work on at Tech Freedom is the fact that the digital revolution isn't just about what happens on your desktop now. It is increasingly changing all aspects of the, the world around us, right? So, you, for example, you're now seeing little, little delivery drones um, on the sidewalk in, in D.C. Uh, San Francisco, of course, is trying to ban them. And we're seeing uh, certain companies try to play the regulatory game and argue that their their little delivery drone is small enough that it should be able to use the sidewalk, but their competitors is too big and it shouldn't be able to use the sidewalk. Are we going to have dueling delivery drones? I think we we there are. There's a fight like this with USA Today's boxes, by the way, back on the sidewalks <laughs> back in the day. Well, and, and in a sense, <laughs> all this has happened before. My 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 point is that this this kind of change, this ability to accept uh, change at different levels of our life. This is becoming more and more salient for tech policy because we're now talking about transformation all across the board. So with, with that example, I, I, I want to um, get us back to the late 90s. And, and at that point, we were thinking about the internet primarily. I heard Representative Cox today talk about uh, how he and, and Representative, then Representative Wyden sat down and talked about uh, keeping the internet free from, from publisher liability, Section 230, and keeping it free from taxation, right? Those were the two big ideas back at that time that have survived. They're still, in one form or another, still in statute. We still fight about those things. We're fighting about them literally today. And, and so my question is, again, getting the, the overall theme here is about frames of reference and how we accept change and so on. The, the, the first level of this was, OK, well, traditional publisher liability and taxes. Those were the things that, that regulators and, and states, in particular, were focused on back then. We've now spent the last 20 years, uh, in particular, fighting well, about both of those things that we're fighting about at the FCC, we're fighting about at states. They're all part of the same fight. And Veronique, this is where I wanted to bring you in. In particular, you've been very active and engaged on not just the question of tax, but of, of the borderless nature of the internet, of, of states trying to assert their traditional authority, not just to tax, but to collect information from businesses, to impose costs upon them that that they uh, have chosen not to bear because they don't do business in that state, and yet, by virtue of selling over the internet, that state may claim the, the ability to tax them. Just, just big picture here, how do you, when you look back at the 90s and you contrast the way that people thought about borderlessness then to the idea today that the internet can be bordered and put into neat little boxes, well, what do you think we should learn from that comparison? Well, first, I mean, I guess when the internet was was born, right? I mean, I don't think that anyone thought about the commercial, the 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 tremendous commercial aspect of the internet. Obviously, some people um, saw it and envisioned it as as a as a platform where uh, commerce could take place, but I don't know that anyone at the time imagined what a central role it would it would play. Right, and it's not as if um, from the beginning there were no tax on the internet. There were no, um, especially for commerce. Uh, I mean, the, the the restriction there was really specifically that a state was not allowed 
to go and enforce its taxes on a company that didn't have jurisdiction, that didn't have a nexus in that state. So it was basically no taxation without representation. And it still is the regime under which we are, except uh, that states have been trying to challenge it more and more. And, and, um, and this is, by the way, this is, this, is, this is a battle that is fought not only over internet sales taxation, but it's a, it's, it's a, it's a growing concern um, of how do you design a tax system to make sure that, um, that states don't go and grab income uh, where they don't have jurisdiction, because that raises issues of enforcement. Uh, and, and, and really, when it comes to the internet, the question is like, when the internet basically has allowed a system where um, you could go and buy pretty much everywhere you want without having to be physically there, does it mean that along with you, the government can ride along with you through this internet thing and mean that it can start taxing you everywhere? Right, and there are a lot of people who, who think that, that we should have that. Yes. And they have been pushing legislation, they're trying to overturn Supreme Court precedent, and, and essentially they want the internet to be a, a bordered medium where you, if you reach out to a particular consumer, that alone subjects you to, to, to jurisdiction. And, and the reason I'm asking about this is, this same fight, this is occurring now on the international level, we're having these debates about privacy, about uh, whose laws control for, for privacy and data security. We saw all these fights in a way coming, not, not the specifics, but the general idea was clear in the 90s. And when Tech Freedom launched um, six and a half years ago, this is what we did our first event about in large part, was this, this question of whether the internet really was different, whether governments could try to control it. And in the 90s, people like John Perry Barlow said, no, it can't, it can't control it. Those you weary giants of flesh and steel, you governments of the industrial world, you have no sovereignty where we gather, right? That vision of internet exceptionalism was clearly wrong descriptively. Governments can, but should they? So here's the thing, okay? We still do economic statistics on a national level. We still talk about trade, we talk about digital trade. We have not actually moved our thinking along with the internet. So I did a, a, an essay fairly recently called Beyond the Balance Sheet Economy. And the balance sheet economy is the idea that everything needs to add up. And in an internet data-driven world, everything doesn't need to add up. And your international borders don't work the same way. But the fact is, is that government statistics, which in fact is what forms the framework for how governments think about these things, are still national and still assign all economic activity to a country. And to the degree to which inter internet is an economic activity, it willy-nilly gets assigned to a particular country, even if it doesn't belong there. So we're actually at the point where we we have to break the bounds of our conceptual framework that we've lived with comfortably so many years. If I ask the question here, how many people in this room has, you know, read the national, you know, or sort of follow GDP growth and so forth and know what it is? And the answer is people are still comfortable with a national framework. And if we really believed that internet was cross-border, which it is, we'd, we'd start thinking differently about it. Interesting little wrinkle in that, that's something I wrote about. So back during, one of the big, I think largely unanticipated uh, advances in recent years has been cloud computing. And one of the reasons I say that it's an advance is that it has made it much, much easier to start various kinds of enterprises because you don't have to buy all these servers and hire teams to maintain them and all of that, you can contract it out to Amazon or Google or whoever. Well, back during the Greek crisis, there was this problem of, uh, of Greek entrepreneurs who could not pay their Amazon web services bill because they could not export currency. Mm. This is something it, nobody thought about it. This is exactly what you're talking about. You're talking about in terms of statistics. It wasn't that anybody wanted to hurt these people. It, it was just something nobody thought of. It was these sort of categories. Well, you have your, your Greek bank account, and, and yet the 
inter the cloud, we have this, this term for it. I mean, these servers actually exist somewhere specific, but we imagine them in, in just in heaven. So, so you, you, you go. What you were saying, it still doesn't change the fact that it raises a question. The fact that the internet allows us to reach out through commerce or you know communication or any sorts of way to people all over the world doesn't give license for any government anywhere in the world to have jurisdiction over that's people right. who aren't. That, and right. so in that sense, well, I totally agree with you that we have this national mentality. I mean, there are things that will never change, and yet the forces and the, the pressure to 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 kind of to tie all these things together when they really shouldn't be um, is really problematic, I think. So the, the, the example I was trying to provide with, with John Perry Barlow's <laughs> Declaration of the Independence of Cyberspace is that in the 90s, it seems to me, there was the way of making this was if only we put it poetically enough. If only, you know, if we, if we, if we all got stoned enough. It was also, it was, I think there was a that rhetorical was, thing. It was all, also, <laughs> we can, if we sell something as technologically determined, we don't have to make the policy arguments. Ex that's precisely. I think that it, it was, it was, yes, you can put it poetry or you cannot put poetry, but the main thing is you can say, there's nothing you can do about it. You might as well accept it. But in fact, it's just ask the Chinese Communist Party. Is there something you can do about it? Yes, if you right. want to. It, if you want to. You internet to gambling, it, there are many examples hit. of things that in the 1990s people might have said, oh, yeah, the government will never be able to control that. The internet will just make it free automatically. Well, that, that what, what uh, Eric Goldman calls first wave internet exceptionalism, that, that was clearly wrong. People did have to make the policy arguments. You all have been making them in very specific areas ever since. And, and so this is, this is where I wanted to go with this, is this is a policy audience. W what sort of advice would you give them about how to learn from these lessons, about the, the difficulty of, of using yesterday's categories, of trying to reason by analogy? How instead should they think about the future to avoid the sorts of mistakes that, that people have made in the past? Can, can I add something to the category you Please? made? I mean, we, we were talking a lot um, in the 80s and 2000s about the fact that we shouldn't actually worry that much about regulation and taxes on the internet because the government would never be able to reach out to, and, and but what we found out, and this is by the way an issue that we're having with cryptocurrencies right now, right? It's like, yeah, it's, it's decentralized to some extent. The moment there is a platform that exists, that's where the government's gonna go after. You can be as decentralized as you want, the existence of any platform, you take um, on the tax side, you take a, a Etsy, right? You have these moms selling stuff all over the world, right? Some dads too. Some dads, sorry. <laughs> sorry, I'm, yeah. Um, and, and, and you could say, well, it's just how is the government gonna go? I mean, the, the compliance, you know, the, 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 the enforcement burden, well, it's actually not that bad if you go after the platform, Amazon, um, you know, cryptocurrency, go after Coinbase, go after, and, and, and so that, these were mistakes that were made in not fighting actually hard enough the policy ideas because we thought, eh, it's not gonna happen. Certain technological complacency. Mm -hmm. so. You know, I did a paper with Brett Swanson called The Coming Productivity Boom. We divided the world into digital industries and physical industries. And the digital industries were, have been doing really well, fast productivity growth, fast job growth, uh, 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 sort of very low price growth. And the, and the physical industries have really lagged behind. And I actually think the way to think about this, and you, know, you may not agree, Vern, but I think the way to think about this is that if to the degree we have government attention, we should focus on what's standing in the way of the physical industries, the, the atoms, Okay, and I'm thinking about this and as a two by two matrix with high innovation and low innovation industries, high price industries and low price industries, and what the government should be focusing on is how do you get the low innovation, high price industries moving? And in some cases it means less government regulation, in some cases it means breaking down market power, and that this is really what's standing in the way right now. All this you know, attention on the, the digital, the internet's working really well. Okay, the internet, 
you know, we have a lot of growth in digital industries. We have a lot of innovation, and we can sort of stay here and sort of, you know, from everything from cloud to e-commerce, all sorts of different places, and that really we should be turning some of our attention here to the parts of our economy which are not doing well. The price, of, depending on what price measure you look at, the price of construction has gone up 100% since 2000. And that's just incredible. So there's some of the reason why you don't get the building is because it's so goddamn expensive. Can I curse here? Is that okay? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, and so um, uh, I would sort of say that, that, that as part and parcel of debating IT policy, we also have to think about policy and the rest of the economy as well to sort of ensure that we don't, we're not running a two-track economy where some, in, uh, some parts of it are going really fast and some parts of it are going really slowly. And, and where I would tie these two things together is it has to do with sort of reifying the wrong categories. And I, I'm, I apologize, this is very abstract, but... but, but making a thing but, out of... But, yeah, making a thing out of... We, we, we make regulations assuming the categories that exist at a given time, and they may change. So that instead of, um, use your construction example, uh, instead of making a regulation, and of course I'm gonna get out on the limb here and where I don't know, where it's about achieving a certain goal, it'll be about using a specific material. Or uh, if if you make a, a regulation, uh, uh, I mean, and that that or or instead of being about achieving a certain goal, it's about a specific uh, dictating a specific use. I have an example in my book about how when when um, Starbucks went into San Francisco, which was fairly late in Starbucks' life, and so it was a well-known company. It encountered these zoning rules where they had said. It was okay to have takeout, but but not sit down. No, you, yeah, mm -hmm. you couldn't sit. You couldn't sit. So because people wanted retail stores and they didn't want restaurants in this certain area, and and this is something I have seen this exact same policy fight about stores versus restaurant in Westwood Village near where I live. This is just as a citizen. Uh, because the people who have crushed the life of Westwood Village like stores and they don't like restaurants. And yet the economy is moving toward e-commerce and a lot of c food consumption outside of the house. So they've made rules that make it very hard to adapt, which are very different from much more specific than general density rules or general sort of zoning uh, what people, what the average person thinks of when they think of, of, of land use regulation. Isn't it also a case, and I'm going to butcher the theory because, I mean, Adam Thier is here and it's his and, and it's right and it's, but it just like, the, the problem is like the mindset of regulators who are very well intentioned, I'm sure, and the thing that sets the 90s apart and, 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 and the, the, the internet and the way it was, is this, 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 commitment to permissionless innovation, which is a completely different mindset. I think that if we had this mindset across whole, all, like whole, like areas, right, including construction, because I actually do think that tying the thing with low income earners and, and things like this, is like the moment you bring down the cost through innovation of those budget items that are so big, like energy, housing, and food, which, by the way, I believe government is not the solution. It's innovation is going to actually really, you know, healthcare, like bring down those costs uh, tremendously. It's like it, you need a mindset of regulation that's really pretty much the reverse of what. And I, I, would, we've had. I would correct you on one thing, which is that you said this is the regulator's mindset. And I don't think that, those, that there's Our like regulator. Interest? I think it's the public's mindset. Yeah, special interest. I, I think that, I mean, I, I saw this recently, and there was some Twitter exchange about the price of housing. And I, and, and I said, every housing regulation has a good intention, and, and 
it increases costs or something like that. I said it better than that, but there's a, there's a good reason. There's a good, I think I just said, there's a good reason behind every new housing regulation and it increases it, it increased cost. And everybody said, oh, do you want to burn up in a fire? And that was the response. Like, if we don't mandate two parking places for every bedroom in LA, we're going to have all burned down in a fire. It, or if we, and, and I'm redoing my kitchen. Yeah, I think so. Uh, we're, I'm redoing my kitchen right now. And, and the number of things that have changed since the kitchen was originally built, which would, if you were building it today, make it more expensive to build the same, same unit, it is extraordinary. And they're all very marginal, but over time that, that accumulates, this, just like marginal is, innovation accumulates. This is, this is the point that I wanted to get to, is that we, we, we're not all libertarians on this panel, that, that's intentionally so. And, and, and this isn't just a debate about the role of government. Mike, Mike and other people may, may want a more active government, and yet may still actually, on a more cultural and psychological level, may actually be in, in agreement that, that old categories don't work. This is what I find so great about your book, Virginia, is that it, it's an attempt to, to step outside of the, the normal left-right debate. So it's not just about libertarianism. No, it's, it, it's about mindset. And, and you've identified, and we've all identified, um, modes of thinking that people get stuck in. And, and it seems to me to be very difficult to persuade someone that they should accept uh, permissionless innovation on a policy level if they're still thinking about things um, from uh, pessimism, fear of the future, and an assumption that they can easily uh, navigate, use the old categories and, and apply them to new technologies, or that they can rely upon analogies. They can say, oh, well, that's, I understand that new thing. We'll treat it like this old thing. And yet, look at the Lego movie. That movie did boffo box office. And what was it about? It was about the struggle between being able to recombine the Legos and glue them all down and keep them. <laughs> and, and I will say that you, you forget. You, it's, yeah. See, for me, I saw it was like cronyism all the way. Speech. All I could see was a cronyism. The, yeah, it's like the, like the, the unhealthy marriage between <laughs> the big business and government. That's what I saw. <laughs> <laughs> but so yes, everybody we're all projector. But right. I think you're also forgetting the, it's not just permissionless innovation. It's like this, this pretense of knowledge yeah. mindset that's prevalent everywhere. In, 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 me, me, meaning people think they know. Yeah, and, and, and that they know better than other people. That's what I tell my kids all the time. I know better than you. Is it true? <laughs> no. Well, sometimes, you yes. You <laughs> when, it comes, when, it comes, when it comes to electronic, <laughs> absolutely not. <laughs> you know, I, 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 I have... want to turn, turn to the audience for questions. I just want to ask one more question of all of you. So there's another theme. We've talked about uh, taxes and, and borderlessness and, and cultural mindset. Um, but there's a big theme, and Mike touched upon this lurking behind this discussion, which is deep-seated fears, right? There are a lot of privacy is another one, but, but big is bad, right? There's a lot of concern, and you just saw this with the um, Chuck Schumer came out. The Democrats have attempted to, um, uh, to, to, to offer a message. Uh, Chuck Schumer's attacked in the Hillary campaign saying that she, she lost because she didn't offer a message, and his message instead is, uh, is new and fresh. And what it looks like to me is a lot like um, Brandeis' message 100 years ago. Uh, that's the original progressives, and, and saying they're going to go after uh, consolidation, they're going to break up big companies, and that's going to help the American consumer. So, Mike, Virginia, how do you think um, those of us who, who are focused on tech specifically and, and on, on emerging um, markets and, and markets where um, there does tend to be one company that tends to lead because it's a, they change the paradigm, there's a new category, they tend to lead, they tend to be replaced by another company. How should we think about competition here? And, and is that, that urge to, that, that Brandeisian urge to, to break up the big, is that even mm -hmm. worse here? Well, that, this, is why I think, this is why I think a lot about prices and innovation. Okay, so when I look at the tech telecom sector, I see it, and I did this as a blog post yesterday, if people want to look. Now, I see a sector which is uh, very innovative and has uh, uh, almost no price increases at all over the last 15 years. And actually doesn't even have a rising share of consumer spending, which is kind of interesting, given all the changes that are going on. So I think about that in sort of one corner of my two-by-two two matrix, where you've got high innovation and low price growth. 
And I think that there's sectors of the economy, we've mentioned some of them, which have had low innovation and high price growth. And, you know, it may very well be that there is a role for government to at least investigate there. And so from that perspective, you know, I'm sort of sympathetic with the, 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 uh, the proposal that came out yesterday, but I think the, the, it's pointing a little bit in the wrong direction. There may be market power that's holding back innovation and raising prices, but I don't see it in the tech telecom sector. So I, I'm sort of, I'm taking a sort of a case by case, I'm talking about a case by case approach here in terms of industry. We can, you can sort of look and you can find industries and it includes food too, incidentally. Okay, uh, where where you've had price, where you have had less innovation, and you've had much more price growth than you would have expected. Where you need to go back and sort of look and see what can policy do to increase uh, uh, competition, increase innovation, lower prices. In some cases, it may be to sort of look at market power. In other cases, it may be to sort of get, uh, you know. We do regulatory improvement, improve the regulatory system so it doesn't impose so much of a burden. Virginia? Uh, well, I think, first of all, when I think back to the 90s and when I was giving the speeches about the future and its enemies, everybody asked me all the time about Microsoft. And when I think about how much talent on both sides and, and money was wasted on the Microsoft antitrust case and before that on the IBM antitrust case, um, when in fact what happened was a complete change in the development of open source and, and, and browsers became much more like what Microsoft was thinking about. Uh, it, it seems like a tremendous waste, but on, the, on this thing about bigness and badness, and if we stick to well-established U.S. antitrust doctrine, which is consumer-oriented, prices, is there consumer harm? I think we will be okay. I might disagree with this or that thing, but it will basically, every you know, innovation will continue, we won't have a problem. If we decide that we are going to go backwards and adopt a European si style antitrust policy which says we are here to protect companies, not consumers, then we will hamper innovation, we will entrench incumbents, we will waste a lot of people's time and energy and create du duplication where it's inefficient. Um, so that's what I think in terms of that and there was even in the progressive era uh, an argument about are you trying to protect, are you trying to stamp out A&P and the supermarket, which is sort of the Brandeis view, or are you actually worried about higher prices and, and the trusts, which was more of a sort of t Teddy Roosevelt view. But then again, as you mentioned with Microsoft and when the, when the monopoly that exists is not government enforced. Right. It Competition government, comes well, along and it wipes. Well, well, and, and, and it and wipes. And the, the problem that I have with the, you know, so government, you can't stop government from intervening. And, and, and if, if it's going to intervene, I'd rather they have a guideline like the one you highlighted. But the, one of the reasons why I think it is, it is uh, dangerous is, again, this pretense of knowledge is to actually figure out, you know, why is it that there is this company that is in this position of domination. Right, right. And very often, um, and I think Europe is a, is a good case, uh, very often also the incentives, again, the, uh, within government are not necessarily aligned to actually protect real competition, to protect consumers, and there's an alliance with, with big companies. And by the way, to go back full circle to what we were talking at the beginning, one of the things where I thought you guys were going to go about how um, how like how can we explain like the um, the difference the inconsistencies right? Uh, I I thought we were going to end up going in terms of like companies tech companies for instance that were totally in agreement with the mindless the permissionless innovation mindless when they were small tend to actually change and revise sometimes their position when they grow and when they see how they can use government intervention to protect themselves against competition. Even those little drone companies. Oh. Try to Screw their competitor off the sidewalk. <laughs> so I want to turn to the audience. I, sorry, we need, to, we need to wrap up. So I want to take questions from the audience. Uh, if anyone has one, right here in the front. Yeah, 
Is this on? Yeah. Uh, Steve Allen, uh, uh, Capital Research Center, and once at Progress and Freedom Foundation, uh, another yeah. alumnus. Um, uh, 23 years ago when I was trying to explain the internet to people, I would, I would uh, analogize it to Star Trek. And I would say, you know that transporter on Star Trek where you can just beam things? And think of how that would affect the economy if you didn't have to, if you could have, uh, you know, you wouldn't need warehouses anymore, airports or cars. Uh, and now imagine that's information, and you can just beam it somewhere uh, instantaneously. And I said, you know, think of all the ways that'll change society, and that's sort of what's happened. So my question, though, is is regarding the predictions, because that that was that's a very interesting thing to me. Why the predictions would be uh, go in one direction on information technology, and the other direction on most other forms of technology. Uh, the flip side of the, the pace of technological change uh, is the overpredicting. So, what was it? Was could it have been that there was something in the mindset of people at the time that caused them to overpredict in biology and some other areas, whereas they didn't do that uh, in information what, technology, what, or is it just the pace what, of the of would, actual change? I actually took a very straightforward measure, which is I was at that point the chief economics writer at Business Week. Okay, what I did was I looked at articles that were being written on corporate investment and venture capital investment at that time, so places where people are actually putting in money. And so they would put money into gene therapy and it, it didn't happen. So I was looking at, at real money rather than a bit as a measure of prediction as opposed to what people were, as opposed to people were predicting. What I've also done is I've also looked at employment in these areas. And it turns out the employment in material sciences has been pretty much flat. I mean, scientists and materials engineers. And you think about it, if we were really having innovation in those areas, we'd have a real gain in jobs in those areas. And I think one of the peculiar things here, if we have a conference on innovation right now, people expect to see IT. They don't expect to see drug companies. They don't expect to see material sciences companies. You know, they, they are really focused on IT as the, as the edge of innovation. And that would not have been true 30 years ago. And that's the sense in which we've had a really unbalanced innovation, some of which maybe have done to government regulation. I mean, there's a, is a, one can have a long discussion about why this has happened and understand that, it, it, to me at least, the ability to sort of have a more balanced technological innovation is part of the reason why we've had this odd political situation, too, where a lot of people feel like they've been left behind. To put it mildly. Yeah, to put it mildly. A lot of people feel like they've been left behind by, by, by innovation that a lot of us feel in our daily lives. Virginia, reaction? Well, I, I, I agree with that, and I, I think that there's also habituation. One reason that you say about people we feel left behind that is innovation, you know, we feel in our daily life. There, partly we get habituated to um, those innovations very quickly, and partly they're not measured in many cases in their true value in the statistics of, the use my, how much would I pay to have IMDB, or how much would you have to pay me to give up IMDB, which I never would have asked for. Well, it would actually be quite a lot. It's my, my favorite app. <laughs> you never need to have another argument about, like, what was that guy in? <laughs> um, uh, and yet it's free for me. So, so there, there, there's that, but I also, th but, but, but I also think it, it is, there is a question about what's salient, too. And, and I'm doing a lot of work right now on textiles uh, and textiles as technology and even getting people to think of textiles as technology and not just wearables, but material science pro pro uh, uh, progress, machinery, uh, the invention of textiles uh, is, is very difficult. and yet it's one of the oldest technologies. And so partly we've gotten this idea that technology equals IT. And I think that does go back to the fact that it's so much easier to do things in the world of bits than in the world of atoms. And partly that is scientific and sort of the, the, the real world that is either we were already farther to the frontier, or biology is harder than software, these things are true, or it's regulatory. These, the physical is much more heavily regulated. 
Well, we're going to have to um, cap things off there. Um, Mike, Veronique, thank you. And uh, Virginia and I are going to do a lightning round here to wrap up the day. So, uh, to leave the stage now? Please. Okay. Uh. I, you know what kind of person he is. <laughs>